Hello, welcome back. After like five, six years of no videos, I finally found the time to get back to the things I like in life, which is building speakers. And I did a short on my room because I changed houses. I sold all my tools, all my measurement equipment. I'm starting fresh. This took a little while because I had to sort things out, but I'm back and the first thing I did was build a subwoofer, which is right behind me here. It's the Dayton Ultimax 18 inch version two. So like UM 18 two or something like that. So I'm gonna share that with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a little bit of the build process, but generally this video I intend to be more about the measurements and how I integrate it into my room and kind of showing off the driver a little bit and then I'll share my final thoughts. So check it out. Yeah, so just real quick, we'll cover the build a little bit. If you guys are interested in more of this build, let me know in the comments and I'll do a full length build video on this thing and share the, all the dimensions and construction and stuff. But generally, you know, with subwoofers, a big part of the equation is the box that I put it in. So when I'm reviewing this driver, I think it's fair to know what I did with the box. Unlike a tweeter or something where that doesn't matter as much other than maybe some diffraction off of the edges or something. So anyways, this was a 6.1 cubic foot sealed enclosure, which works out to about five and a half cubic feet when I remove all the volume of the bracing and driver. So net five and a half cubic feet. It has two baffles and I did it all out of one sheet of three quarter inch plywood. I sped things up by nailing it together, although I did clamp it and let the glue dry. Um, just to help, you know, I only have four clamps. I wanted to speed things up and not wait a full 24 hours. At this point, I've got the box all trimmed up and everything else. So I filled all the nail holes and plywood voids and things like that with Durham's rock hard putty. It had been a while since I used this stuff and it is rock hard. So sanding this was a pain. So beware. Once I had it all sanded up, I used laminate. For the finish, I used a black matte laminate from Formica. It, this product is, I believe, Formica 909. Also, one sheet covers this box. I use contact cement. I paint one side of the Formica and then the side of the box that I'm gonna seal it to. And then this is the scary part. You let it dry and then you, you know, push it down on there like that. And if you are misaligned, you're stuck. So on this, it's pretty easy because it's a solid color, but if you're using a wood grain laminate or something, be very careful. And then I just trim up the laminate with a trim router. I did this all the way around the box. I like to do the bottom and back first and then the top and baffle last because with laminate, you do get a little bit of an edge that you can see and it's not the prettiest. So trying to hide that as much as possible is a good idea. So your first piece should definitely always be on the bottom. I used my edge guide as a circle jig to create the flush cut for this driver. I have never bought a specialized circle jig for building speakers. That's just my choice. I find this works just as good and I can really dial it in however I like it. I'm also gonna paint the inside lip of the recess because it might show drill a little hole in the base plate of my router. This is to do the terminal cup on the back of the enclosure. I did screw this up. It was a little bit tight and a little bit deep. So it wasn't the best. Okay, this is me just filing the edges of the laminate because laminate can be really uh, sharp. And then I attach some rubber feet and the terminal cup and wiring and I'm off to the races. Give it one last cleanup. And this is the box, all finished, ready for the driver. But I'm not going to put the driver in yet because first we're going to measure the TS parameters. I think it looks great. Okay, let's get the driver out of the packaging and have a look at this thing. I think it's beautiful. Dayton did an excellent job on the aesthetics. The carbon fiber weave cone is really nice. The surround is really nice. The basket is cast aluminum, I believe. It's very nice. Uh, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but everything on this driver is very clean. There isn't glue and burrs and everything slop all over the place. The um, plates are polished. 
It's got dual spiders. You can only see one, of course, but uh, they're in great shape. This is the push terminals, which I'm not, this is maybe the least fancy part of the thing. They're fine. I'm not a big fan of push terminals, but they they seem to be on every high-end subwoofer. You can see a little bit of machining marking down in the pull piece there. Everything's ventilated nicely. Um, so, I mean, they polished the back plate, but didn't polish the pole, which, I mean, that's fine. I'm not going to mark them down for that. There's no stitching on the surround to cone, which kind of makes me nervous. I guess it's glued, but it's all very nicely glued. Hopefully it holds up, but it's uh, very clean. No glue drips or anything like that. You can have a sneak peek of the voice coil here. You can see one little bit of glue. Okay, with the build out of the way, now let's take a look at the measurements. I'll start with the electrical measurements. Uh, it's a dual 2 ohm voice coil driver, and I want it to be configured for 4 ohm. So I just run a jumper from the positive to negative on one side, and then I do some break in. Although, admittedly, I didn't break it in a ton, so this driver is probably not fully broken in yet. So just keep that in mind. First, I measure outside of the box. This is just an peanut sweep, and it turned out it's not the cleanest sweep. And I'm thinking DATS doesn't have enough power to drive a big driver like this, you know, to fully realize the results. And then I um, go ahead and wire it up to put it into the box. This is kind of the moment of truth. And I like to use as little wire as possible, so it's kind of tricky here. Um, but yeah, this is the moment of truth to see if everything fits good. I actually hadn't test fitted it yet because this is a big driver and it's a pain to get in and out of the box. But it actually turned out really good. It fit like a glove, actually. And then I do a sweep in the enclosure. So this is in the enclosure. Uh, for some reason, the measurement was a lot cleaner. There was an 11 hertz difference. So it went from about 27 up to 38 hertz. This is as expected. We predict that when you put it in enclosure, the FS will increase in frequency. As mentioned earlier, this is all new software and measurement equipment for me. To get the TS parameters, I took the impedance plot outside of the cabinet, then I put the driver in the cabinet and retook it again. This is standard procedure for getting the um, VAS measurement. Unfortunately, the cabinet was too, too large, according to the software, to get a good reading on how the impedance plot changes. I am kind of annoyed with Dayton for this because I think they should give you a warning that it could should be smaller but still do the calculation. So I'm stuck without that and I wasn't going to pull the driver out and build a test box that's smaller. I pushed forward, I used the moving mass from the manufacturer, Dayton, to back calculate VAS. So that's how I came up with that. So yeah, this is a simple thing to do in WinISD. You can put in the manufacturer's MMS and back calculate VAS. So that's what I did here. And you can see the general match between the manufacturer's specs and my specs. Here they are in WinISD. Blue line is Dayton's specs. Red line is my specs. There's about one dB difference, but efficiency is about the same. Inductance is close. And ultimately, like I had said, I didn't fully break in this driver, so we might get that decibel back. I'd say there's a good match here. Not perfect, but good. This is the location I'm gonna put the sub in. Boom, there it is. I might move it around, we'll see. Here I'm taking a near field measurement to get my baseline anechoic, and then an in-room sweep. Okay, this is the anechoic response from the near field measurement. There was a 200 hertz crossover on this thing. Getting about 13 dB per octave, which is good. Um, you know, the box isn't ginormous and it's not fully broken in, although I wouldn't expect much more from more break-in. So this is a good result. I mean, it's it's hard for sealed drivers to do 12 dB per octave, even though people think that's normal. Often we get less. And this is compared to the WinISD prediction, so we're down about a decibel. That's okay. But Collectively, we're about down two decibels from the manufacturer's WinISD response, so keep that in mind. Okay, this yellow line here is my right speaker, and I used 110 hertz crossover on my receiver, my AVR, but you can see it came up with about 120 hertz crossover uh, in the real world, but this is because the subwoofer is running a bit too hot. 
which is okay. Here's the in-room response. And so there's a few things going on here to talk about. The first is a bunch of dips from starting at 80 hertz and then you know 140 hertz roughly and so on and so forth all the way up. This is quite normal. This is what happens in rooms, especially a room like mine where I have no absorption. I don't even have a couch in this room yet. So I'm gonna kind of let that slide for now. That's my own problem. And I think it's something that will get better when I fix up this room. Okay, the next thing I wanna look at is the room gain. So this is what I love about sealed subwoofers. They're not just easier to build and smaller, they also give you a ton of low frequency extension. You can see down below 20 hertz, I'm getting tons of room gain. 5, 10, 15, even 20 decibels perhaps. And I'm not even showing the graph below 10 hertz. A ported subwoofer would have to shut things down at usually about 20 hertz. So you have to put in a high pass filter to stop over excursion of the cone. And that would really drop off the output. The last thing to talk about is that 60 hertz peak. Some parametric EQ can pull this down using a DSP, which I plan on doing. Yes, I can hear it. Yes, it sounds awful, but it's not a fault of the subwoofer. It is a fault of the room, absolutely. I can't fix this with room treatment. I have to use DSP for this. I, it'd be very difficult to do. Uh, just putting a couch in there probably isn't gonna take care of this. So yeah, I'll fix it with DSP, but it does sound very, very bad. Despite that, I spent a lot of time listening to this subwoofer. Uh, anything from rap music to action movies to rock and roll, you name it. The subwoofer sounds amazing. I'm very happy with it. I do think the extra time and material spent in distortion control on this driver was well worth it for Dayton. The extra copper or aluminum or whatever was used in the motor definitely helps the driver sound clean. It's got a powerful motor, so it handles this relatively small box, even though it's a huge box. For the size of the driver, it's pretty good. It handles it well. We get nearly a 12 dB per octave roll off, so that's good news, and I'm quite happy with the performance of this thing. I have to ask myself, how does it compare to the rest of the competition? This thing is about $340, if I'm not mistaken. There's a lot of subwoofers out there, 18 inch and other sizes as well, that you have to think about that give it a run for its money. Ultimately, I think this offers very good value. You could look at, say, some kind of car audio subwoofer that would be a whole lot cheaper, but it's probably not gonna be built quite as well as this. And considering I can only put one big subwoofer in this room, practically speaking, I might put two, uh, but practically speaking, one is gonna do it, and then I'll add some satellite tens or something. I would rather spend a little bit more money and get a very good subwoofer that can do a lot better job. So it kind of depends on your application. But in terms of the value proposition for what this can do, it is there. So overall, I'm really impressed. Good job, Dayton. Uh, I'm really happy with the build. This is one sheet of plywood, very easy to cut up and put together. Certainly a larger ported enclosure would get me a lot more out output down to 20 hertz. But as far as low end extension goes because I am chasing extension below 20 hertz it's it's really hard to beat sealed and I really appreciate the smaller size and simplicity of a sealed enclosure like that especially for this tiny room because I'm going to really take advantage of that room gain and get great performance out of a small enclosure. Let me know your thoughts on the Dayton Ultimax. I'd love to know what people think. Maybe you've used it. Maybe you're curious about buying one for yourself. Thanks for watching everyone.